Great to see everyone here at our conference again. Uh, and uh, this time we have a large crowd, actually. We had to shut down registrations because we ran out of space, which is always a good thing. So, so this is, uh, uh, I think we have about 450 people attending today and uh, from a whole bunch of different countries and places. So my task is to get this started. I don't want to take too much time. What I would like to do is to give those of you, um, uh, give everyone a little bit of a flavor of our bigger vision, what we do, and how it fits into what people's real lives are and so forth on, on a larger scale. And then there's technical talks on all kinds of topics that if you're interested, you can go into particular areas and so forth. So without taking too much time, let me, let me try to catch up a little bit on that time since we're running a little bit late here. So uh, we finished 10 years last year, and uh, it's been a long journey uh, for 10 years. Uh, and yet, from what we're trying to do, this is a very short time, and I'll, I'll explain that in the, in the course of my uh, conversation here. And let me just kind of recap a little bit about the first 10 years and what it was like coming to this point. So we started the company in 2005. We had 12 people in the company at the time, uh, and a little bit of office space uh, in uh, the Merchant Tower building in Colombo, and, and, uh, and got started. And yet, right from the beginning, we had a very big vision as to what we wanted to do. We, we made the statement saying that we are going to build a set of products that will replace what IBM, Oracle, and all the bigger, kind of slightly bigger companies that have in the middleware space. And we also had this approach of saying it's all going to be open source. And that came from a long history of open source work that I have been working on and that I've been doing, because what that uh, uh, translates to is saying you make everything available, we allow people to access it and use it, without any constraints, and then those who want commercial support, those who want uh, interaction with us can get it from us. Uh, but really, uh, WSRU was set up not just to reinvent technology. We, I actually started a foundation here in 2003 called Lanka Software Foundation, which was to help Sri Lankan developers create open source software, not just use Linux or whatever, but create open source software. And part of the effort that we wanted to do when we started WS2 was to show that open source software is not just a, a way of building software and giving it away free, but also a business model that you can actually make it work. Plus, uh, show that you could actually make this kind of stuff work from this side of the world. Uh, as you know, most software technology companies are primarily US-based with a few in Europe, uh, and very few software companies coming out from this side of the world. And, so, and, and also, we want to change how business is done. We, for example, we don't, we don't have uh, negotiated prices. We have a price list, and you can download that off the website anytime you want, and, and that's the price. Uh, there is no, you know, we don't take you to lunch and reduce the price. We don't give you a quote with a discount, none of that stuff. Um, and so, so a lot of things that we want to innovate, not just the technology, but obviously technology is what drove the, the desire to create the, 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 the vision and, and implement it. We are a venture-funded company. Uh, we've raised about $45 million so far. Uh, we're growing very well, but in, in, in the context of what we're trying to do, in the context of replacing IBM and Oracle and so forth, we are still a very small company. So we don't view us as anything but a startup. We are like a 10 and a half year old startup, which is still innovating as rapidly as we can, that is questioning everything, that is not taking anything for granted. We don't take any of you for granted. We don't take the technology for granted. We don't. We basically look at it as the world is still all open, and we need to keep keep disrupting everything. Um, and we've got somewhere in 10 years. Uh, we are featured in uh, I think 18, uh, 19 Gartner and Forrester analyst reports right now. Uh, in all but one of them, we are li listed as a visionary. Uh, the other one that analyst doesn't like us. So it's a different conversation. Uh, no, it's not that. He is a good guy, but there's interesting conversations there. Uh, but that, that's pretty good. I mean, there, there's no, for a small company this size, all of our competitors who work in particular segments of this industry, none of them are in more than one or two or three analyst reports. Right? So we are well recognized by the analyst community. Analyst community matters because it influences how people evaluate or consider what to evaluate for technology. And that's an important part of how we get access to customers. Uh, we ship about 25 products. And you'll understand a little bit later when I talk about how we build stuff, why even I don't know how many products we actually ship right now, right? And, and why, why that's not a problem. Uh, uh, we have about 300 customers. We've grown from the 12 people to about 500 people now. Actually, a little bit more than 500 if you count the 60 or so interns that work in the company at any given time. 
uh, and we, are, uh, we operate globally. We have three offices here, uh, two in the US, one in UK, and one in Brazil. And, and it's a continuous conversation, and, and we operate in a completely distributed, decentralized mode, and obviously use tons and tons of email to make that all work. Uh, so let me, let me kind of uh, explain what we do it in a high level, then take it down to a, a, the way we touch the world. So we, of course, build middleware. We set out saying the enterprise middleware space has an opportunity to be reinvented because the services concept, SOA and the services concept, was creating a fundamental change in how you could innovate within an organization. And you needed, therefore, a new set of technology to make that work. Right? That was very important. There was a technology change happening in the world at the time which allowed us to say, OK, there's an opportunity here to go reinvent everything. Right? And that's how we got started. So we built that stuff. We built all the middleware. But we don't build the same middleware that the old guys have. We look at the problem and say, what does a customer who is trying to create innovative value-added products, innovative offerings, innovative capabilities, their, their customers, what do they want from technology vendors? And we try to figure that out and try to build that. We don't always get it right. When we don't get it right, we do it again. And, and, uh, but one key thing about the way we've done it is we set out from the beginning saying we are going to look at that entire space, saying what does anybody need that sits on top of an operating system and all the way up to everything they do. So that entire gap is what we want to fill, not a piece of it. And so that's a platform, and that's a platform designed to be a platform. And, uh, and we are the only company that has ever done that. Even IBM and Oracle, who are our largest competitors, obviously, have a platform, of course. But they're all a bunch of acquisitions beautifully marketed together as one product family. And it's not a product family. When you go down there, it's not a product family at all. And all the smaller vendors have one product that slowly expands into being other things. So we didn't do it that way. We set up saying we, we, we have to solve this problem properly. To solve the problem properly, you must look at the holistic problem and address, find a way to cover the whole space. And that's what we are doing. So let me, let me tell you a story about how a few, few customers and, uh, work with us. So they'll give you a little bit of an idea of how uh, how things work. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go on a trip, and I'll take you through a few steps here. So the first thing is I need a phone to arrange the trip. Uh, so I'm going to buy a Motorola phone. Uh, if you go to the Motorola website and you buy a Moto X, and you customize it, and you put your name there to customize it, and when you order that thing, that's going through WC2 software. Right? So everybody who's got a Moto X phone is touching WC2 software. So now you got your phone. Now you need to call the airline to arrange a flight. So when you call the airline, uh, if you uh, West Corporation is one of our customers, one third of all US conference calls and a huge percentage of customer service infrastructure in the US is done by West. And what they do with WC software is really interesting. Uh, so if you ever call somebody to do something uh, and they ask you what's your address, what's your name, all this stuff, uh, especially if you're talking to a US agent and you have a foreign accent, often it's very difficult to explain. The, the, you know, it takes a couple of iterations and so forth. What West is doing is something called omnichannel interaction, so which is not just a, you know, a multi-channel interaction saying you can interact with the company from different channels, but it's interact with the company simultaneously. So while you're on the phone, they will email you or SMS you a link that you can go to and fill in the data that they're asking for. Right? And then that integrates to the conversation that you're having with the customer service rep right then and there. And that kind of integration is what they're building with WC2. So now I've got my flight, and I go to the airport. How do I get to the airport? Well, I'm going to take an Uber, right? Well, if you use Uber, Uber actually is using WS2 software to do fraud detection. Uber doesn't run completely on WS2, at least not yet. Uh, they, they do a uh, complex event process for doing fraud detection. And an interesting comment at the bottom that I'm going to touch upon later, Uber is actually not a paying customer. And this is quite OK for us, right? That we have, because we build everything open source, we expect people to use our stuff. And we expect them that there will be a whole bunch of people who don't pay us at all. And that's fine. Um, and they are using open source stuff, at, and, and they're happy with it. So now I'm get to the airport. When I get to the airport, I'm at the Chicago airport. I need to get to the gate. Um, I can't name the airline because uh, it's not public yet. But uh, it's a major US airline. If you are flying that airline at the Chicago airport, when you get into the terminal, if you have the app on your phone, it'll tell you exactly how long it's going to take for you to get through security. Because there are beacons uh, installed in all over that airport which track how long it takes for a particular person to get through security. And then again, they use our complex event process to analyze that data and average out and compute what's the current running time to get through from here to there. Right? And the next step, they're going to do additional things like they will know that, OK, this guy is supposed to be on this flight. Where was he last seen, he or she last seen? So then they can hold the flight for another minute if the person is nearby. Right? So, so things like that. There's a whole series of things that can be done. 
Of course, when you fly, you fly on a plane. If you fly on a Boeing plane, Boeing is one of our customers. Boeing builds a, uh, a platform for what they call digital airline platform, which is to enable people to uh, uh, enable airlines to collaborate and share data and applications across each other. Right? That entire platform is built with WC2 software. Uh, where am I going to? Well, I'm flying through Dubai, of course. Everybody flies through Dubai these days. When you transit in Dubai, if you land in Dubai and you do any digital services in Dubai, Dubai has a digital identity platform called MyID. That's WS2. That's our identity server running there. And also, they have a, they're building another portal called a citizen portal and a visitor portal. And that portal is also built on WS2 dashboard server. <coughs> so I'm going through Dubai. So where are you going to? Well, you're going for a concert. So hey, we're going to go for an NDRK concert. Right? So we buy a ticket. To buy a ticket for the NDRK concert, you go to StubHub. StubHub is an online ticket seller. It's a ticket seller and a reseller. Um, and everything in StubHub runs on WS2. So when you're visiting the website, it's making hundreds of API calls to our API manager, which is driving all this stuff. Now, when you go to a uh, Enrique concert, you hear that sometimes interesting things happen in Enrique concerts. So you want to buy a camera. So you go to eBay and you buy a camera. Uh, you were thinking of buying something that you could throw, but not so politically correct. So um, for those of you not in Sri Lanka, just Google Enrique Colombo concert. You'll find out what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> So you get this camera, now you're ready to go. So you, you get there, and you go to the conference, and you af uh, go to the concert after that. You're hungry. You want a pizza. You order a pizza from Domino's. You're touching WC2 software. Well, you got to pay for the pizza before you can eat it. Uh, Veryphone, which is the largest uh, uh, credit card approval infrastructure that boxes there, almost all of them are Veryphone. Uh, Veryphone is, building, uh, uh, is using WC2 software for a very interesting thing, which is to integrate uh, payment with third-party loyalty systems. So you can say, oh, I got some miles, some points on my American Express card by flying, by buying the ticket uh, for the flight on my Amex card. I can use those points then to pay for the pizza. Right? And that's the level of integration they're working on. And there's also a bunch of other things. Um, finally, I need to check into a hotel. I go to a Hilton. Hilton uses WC2 software. Right? And of course, once you get to the hotel, you say, I want to watch some TV. Well, you go to Dialog and say, well, you know, Dialog integrates almost everything internally using WS2. They use a whole bunch of API manager ESP for a whole bunch of scenarios. Uh, then you realize, oh, shoot, I forgot to register my car. Uh, this is kind of a stretch of my scenario because, <laughs> but I needed to show these two, so I had to put them in. So you forgot to register the car, you go to the, the Sri Lanka government uh, vehicle registration uh, system to register the car. This is running on services built on WS2 uh, done by the ICT agency. Uh, and then you realize, oh, I forgot to pay my property taxes, too. And if you happen to live in Nigambo, you can use the e-local government platform that's running there that was, that's running completely on WC2 software. Okay, now you're good. Now you're gone, enjoyed, paid your taxes. So this is the kind of stuff we do, right? So what we do is actually enable our customers to become a better digital business. We don't do this, any of these things ourselves. We are a tool provider. We provide the middleware only. We don't do any of these things that I told you about, these cool, interesting things. Our customers do all that stuff. But we empower them. We build the technology. We build the, the capability. We provide the services sometimes. We certainly provide the support. We provide the ongoing maintenance. And they go and innovate what they want. Our mission is to provide the capability for other people to innovate and create the value they want to create at the lowest possible cost and time and effort. Right? And that's kind of what we have been up to do. And, and we can do it at different levels. So in many companies, in many of the customers that I went through, we are not the only technology provider. And, and we are, of course, we, we play a key role in the scenarios I described, but there are other, other technology platforms available. So that's the reality of any, any significant business today, right? There's all kinds of infrastructure already. So we work with them. We have no issue with that. But if you want to do everything with WS2, we can do that as well. And we have a few customers, a few large customers now who are heading into that. We are kind of migrating the entire platform onto WS2. And that's, that's something we don't expect very large businesses to do with us yet, because we are still a small company. And you can't tell a $100 billion uh, market cap business saying, bet your entire business on this small company yet. Right? That's, that'll get there, but not yet. So this is the kind of stuff we do. Uh, now let me kind of switch gears and tell you how we build all the things that, that people use to create these kind of uh, applications. Uh, so when we, when we ship products, we treat a product as now a combination of three things. One is a server component. It's this thing that runs and actually executes whatever the product is supposed to do. Then there is the, the tooling that helps people actually create the things to, to develop stuff. And there's analytics. So 
So analytics is a very big and important area that has become important very rapidly in the last, I would say, maybe five, at most 10 years, but certainly in the last five years. And what analytics is about is saying, take all the data you have and figure out what can you figure out from the data. So just this morning, uh, uh, let, me, let me not tell the story. It's not a, um, so, uh, so for example, you, know, you walk in here, your cell phone knows your location. Right? So if you use Google, if you, if, you use, if you have an Android phone or, or Google Maps on any phone, Google Maps does traffic in Sri Lanka now. Right? The way Google Maps traffic works is by using the phone data. Because they know, Google knows when the phone moves from here to here and how long it took. And by aggregating enough phone records, you can do a traffic projection. In fact, when I was coming, I live in Dehibala, when I was coming here, uh, I was running a little bit late, and I was a bit worried how long it would take. I checked from Dehibala to Kamiya how long it would take. Google Maps said 23, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, 23 minutes. I got here in 22 minutes. Right? That's how accurate Google Maps is, incredibly accurate on traffic. That's completely analytics. That is purely looking at the data about the phone's location over the hundreds of phones that are, or thousands of phones that are involved in that path, aggregating all that data, analyzing it, and figuring out how dark to make that bit of the map and how to use that to predict how long it's going to take to get somewhere. Right? Um, so that's the way we are building our products. So every product now comes with a very deep analytics infrastructure, uh, which, uh, which there's a talk coming up about it, about the kind of analytics we do, so I won't get into that, and really making it part of the product experience so that we can help you analyze the data that you're going to generate when you do any kind of digital interaction. So what we've done is to create a platform of capabilities. As I said, that was the vision from, from the beginning, and that's exactly what we have done. So we have continued to evolve what is the right platform, and we continue to evolve that every day. And we have created a series of products that make all of this stuff work together and that cover all the scenarios and a lot more that I didn't go through uh, in terms of what customers can do with our technology. Uh, we're also evolving that thinking even further now. It's really platforms on platforms. We're also evolving our core capabilities into being sort of local platforms themselves. So if you look at the identity server, it's a good one because federation is a very important concept. So, so the idea there is uh, when, when you need to log into something more and more, people don't like to be told create a username and password. The, the preferred model is to say, well, if you have a credit credential from Facebook or Google or, or your phone, uh, mobile connect, whatever, use that to log in. So to do all that, you need an identity federation infrastructure. Identity server does that. But there are hundreds of different federation protocols uh, to integrate. So identity server is really a platform for doing all those integrations and connect them into a, a single framework and so forth. So, so we make a, we make a con very concerted effort to make our technology into something that can be extended for particular use cases as much as possible. At the same time, of course, we ship a product called an ESP, Identity Server, IoT Server, and so forth, which have particular capabilities that are very useful out of the box, but they're also designed to be extended for other scenarios. Let me uh, explain a little bit about the culture and how we do things and the way we operate, because it kind of influences uh, the way we think about how we interact with customers and, and the way we think about uh, the product evolution as well. Uh, as a company, we have a model of um, sort of broadcast all information to everyone. So every email that was sent, if, if when you registered to the conference, there's an email sent to the marketing team saying there's a registration for the conference, that registration is actually sent to every employee in the company. Now you can say, what in the world does every employee care about seeing every single registrant's information? Right? Uh, or if you are a customer and you open a support ticket and you make a comment on a particular support issue, that comment is visible to me, visible to every engineer, visible to every account manager, visible to everybody in marketing. So every interaction is publicly visible within the company. The reason we do that is to enable people to operate in a manner where you have some understanding what everybody else does. And this came from my own experience in IBM. When I was in IBM, I used to work in IBM Research for eight years. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff that I wrote that went into various products. I had zero interaction with anybody who worked with customers, anybody who did the support, anybody who did the marketing, anybody who talked to the analysts, and so forth about that technology, even though I'm the one who created it. Right? Because that's the way compartmentalized execution works. We have no compartmentalized execution uh, allowed at all in the company. We, we insist on visible communication, and it allows, also very importantly, it allows people to have very strong debates about ideas and not about people. 
because you know what everybody else is doing. If you want to have an opinion, you can get in there and give an opinion. You don't like the color of the design of this conference banner, this was sent on a mailing list that every single employee in the company could have seen if they wanted to participate. If you have a better idea, suggest a patch. Right. Um, so we, we follow that very religiously. We, we don't allow any interaction without ex visibility to everyone. It really allows us to uh, be able to question everything without having any worrying about, oh, whose toes am I stepping on if I question that? Right? Because everybody knows everything is visible, so it's very straightforward and very easy to communicate and interact. We also don't b believe in the, in the traditional statement, customer is always right. Uh, on, on the technology front, absolutely don't believe it, uh, with all due respect. We certainly listen to customers, but we, don't, we believe it's our job as a technology specialist to know what the right thing to do with technology is and to drive the technology forward. And we continue to learn from everything, from our competitors, from what analysts do, from research papers, from our customers, and all kinds of people, and integrate all that knowledge to figuring out what should we do next. We, of course, don't always get it right. When we don't get it right, we try to fix it. Um, and, and a, uh, but it's not a model of a, somebody says, oh, your product should have this feature. Well, we'll certainly listen to that. Say, well, that's an interesting idea. Why do you want it? How does it work? What is it supposed to do, and so forth. Whether we do it or not is completely a function of how it fits into the larger vision and how we can evolve it into something meaningful for the broader platform that we're trying to create. And the last bullet is very, very important. From our perspective, we don't look at anything we do as completely right. right? And as a, as a customer of ours, you might be a little bit concerned saying, you know, these guys don't even believe their software works properly. Uh, we don't, because the technology is so dynamic and always evolving that you cannot sit and wait saying what we've done before is correct, we don't need to worry about it. So every single piece of work that we have done, we always look and say, what is the fastest way to redo that in a better way? Right? So, so, this is a, so right now we're kind of going through a major platform re-architecture, looking at a complete uh, sort of a next generation set of product architectures and, and so forth. And we are making fundamental changes to things that we made, uh, decisions we made 10 years ago. Right? And it's 10 years later, the world has changed. You have to do that. And we, we always continue to do that, and we will continue to... Uh, obviously, we work with customers to make that work. You know, we don't expect people to jump left, go right, go, go left again every so often. We work carefully with the customers to make that work. Uh, another important point is that the long-term nature. So a lot of technology vendors tend to follow the hype. Uh, you know, right now, the hype is IoT. A few years ago, it was APIs. A few years ago, it was cloud. Before that, it was mashups. Before that, it was ESB. Before that, it was SOA. You know, there's these waves of hype that come going through. We make it a point never to position ourselves as we are that kind of company. Because there is no silver bullet in the world of technology, and there is no one that kind of company that is the right solution for everybody forever. So we are building something that's supposed to last essentially forever. And in order to do that, you have to say, OK, we're going to always look long term, figure out what's going to be the right way to do something in the, in the next iteration, and try to hit that, and, and then keep changing it. Uh, now let me talk a little bit about open source, because it is something that, that is important. And I'll say in, in this part of the world, it's an important part. Uh, so one of the things about open source software is, is really that it is really free to use. There is no catch. Right? Uber is using our stuff free of charge. This is fine. There is no problem with that. We know thousands of other customers, uh, other users, other, um, other p companies are using our WC2 software free of charge. There is no problem with that. Right? Uh, Obviously, Uber, you know, Uber is valued at $40 billion. Hopefully, they will start paying us something because we provide some value to them. That's a different matter, right? Uh, but the other thing that matters from an open sourcing is if you are technically oriented, you can be involved to whatever level you want to be involved. Right? If you want to write code, you can join and write code. All of our technical work is completely public. So we have mailing lists for development work, for architecture discussions. Anybody can participate. Right. Our repository is uh, all, all on GitHub. Anybody can clone it. Every commit we make is on GitHub. Anybody can take it anytime. Right. So we don't hold anything back. Uh, so that's an important thing, too. So there are some people who are technically oriented, who want to participate, who have good ideas. Um, there is no layer. You don't have to go through the salesperson to talk to the technical person, none of that stuff. Because the pe people who are writing the code, making the technical decisions, are externally visible to everybody. You can go and figure out from the mailing list who's the most prolific contributor to the API manager product, and go and talk to that person and get input or have an argument or whatever. That's fine. Right? And have an opinion on, on, on the work we're doing, go for it. Uh, of course, as a commercial organization, we have to make money as well. The way we do that is we provide support. 
And our expectation is that people who are betting their business on this technology will want some kind of support. And the way that works is, is very simple. Uh, there's an analogy given by someone a few years ago, which is uh, there are two kinds of people in the world, people with time and people with money. People with time use their time to save money. People with money use their money to save time. So our paying customers are people with money who want to save time. Our non-paying customers are people with time who want to save money. Both are perfectly happy with us. And if you're using it, we would love to get some feedback, you know, some, some, if you find any problems, if you have ideas, if you want to give us a case study, we welcome all of those things if, if you want to participate. So uh, just to uh, come to the end, I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, a, a lot of our competitors, I'm going to hit on our competitors a little bit now, a lot of our uh, one-dimensional competitors believe in this concept of snake oil. So snake oil is actually a California uh, a, uh, a California invention during the, the gold rush time, which is, oh, if anything goes wrong, there were people going around selling the snake oil bottles, and the, the theory was, oh, you just apply the snake oil to whatever problem it goes away. And actually, in Sri Lanka, it's called Siddhalepa, because uh, my, my daughter, in my daughter's school, the nurse there only applies Siddhalepa no matter what the problem is. If you have a headache, you get Siddhalepa, which is actually fine. If you have a stomachache, you get Siddhalepa, which is kind of, if you have a cut, they put Siddhalepa. Uh, so that's our local snake oil. It does work. It's, it's a very good product. I'm not dissing that one. It's not like snake oil. Um, but so the point is, you can't, in the technology world, you cannot solve all problems with one tool. You need a broad set of tools to address the different dimensions of a problem and put it all together into, into the cool solutions that people need to see and want to see and want to do. Right? And that's what we do. That's the fundamental differentiation between us and whether it is any one of our uh, single vector competitors or platform vendors. We are the only guys who have ever thought about the whole problem and said, we are going to solve the whole problem. It's going to be slightly hard, but we're going to do it. Right? So um, we, are, we started this company you know, 10 years ago, and the objective was to become the number one middleware company. Uh, of course, we knew from the beginning that in 10 years, you can't do that. Uh, IBM's been there for 100 years. Oracle's been there for 30 years, et cetera, uh, or 40 years now. Uh, uh, so it's a long-term path. It's, it's, a, it's a way for us to get there on, on an incremental basis. And really, there is no there. The, you know, this statement saying we want to become the number one middleware player, that's not the objective. The objective is become the, the leading innovator in the space of middleware that everybody uses and, and is happy with. Right? And whether we become the number one in the revenue sense or not, it's not that relevant anymore. What matters is being the primary provider into that opportunity. Uh, we're getting there, but it's, it's, a, it's a long way, and, it, and it's, there is no there, so to speak. Right? It's a journey. And that's what I want to end with. This is a quote from Steve Jobs that I really like. And this also applies not only for us, but also for you. Any company that is trying to transform itself into some digital experience or whatever the innovation uh, agenda that you have, uh, there is no end to any of that stuff. It is always an ongoing path. And you, you make some progress, you learn something, you make some more progress, you learn something, the world changes, you make some more progress, you learn something, and so forth. And it just keeps on going. And that's really what we believe in us, the, the way we work, the way we think about what we do. And, and that's the way we think we are enabling our customers to do. And that's the way we encourage even our customers to think about. Because it's not about a particular end goal. It's not about just hitting the, this year's initiatives or whatever. It's about understanding how do you improve the human condition in some sense on a long-term basis and iteratively step by step. Right. So that's what we are trying to do. And, and uh, so thank you very much for being here. I hope you enjoy the conference. We have a whole lot of different areas that are here that you can, that you can go to. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, and I'm around. If you want to chat with me anytime, I'll be, I'll be hanging around. Plus, you have my email address. Thank you very much. <laughs>